Thank you for that introduction. Um, yeah, so uh, so we've now sort of moved into this phase of working on uh, an atomic clock, and we've been doing that for about, I guess, seven years now, if not a little bit longer. Um, so I'll be telling you today just about our system. Um, helps if you turn it on. It's also true in the lab, as it turns out. Um, yeah, so I'll be telling you a, a little bit about our system. Um, it's uh, pretty unique in the sense that we're the only people doing it. Um, and uh, just, uh, I guess, uh, more about our latest results as we're sort of working towards this multi-ion type of clock. Okay, so why clocks? Um, well, they've always been useful. They probably will continue to be useful, so we might as well make them really good. That would be the the easy thing to say. So um, they're pretty important for our, uh, for, for, uh, uh, have a, an important role in the, uh, our SI standards, um, given that it's the most accurate thing we can measure. And then, of course, uh, Mariana pointed out with the GPS system that needs clocks, and we use it for finding stuff, targeting stuff, and knowing where you are. If you watch the news, I guess people get that mixed up in what they should be doing with these things. But uh, anyways, I think that in terms of navigation and this sort of an application, I think clocks now are sort of surpassing that in terms of how good they are. I don't think we need to uh, know exactly where things are any more accurately than we already do on some level. Uh, so in terms of science, uh, there's applications in many body physics, uh, relativistic geology, uh, and as Mariana was mentioning, the sort of temporal variation of fundamental constants and so forth. And I guess, as I've just learned, trying to find dark matter, whatever that is. Um, so uh, with that, let me start, start with clocks 101, which is what is a clock. And uh, that's pretty easy. So a clock, <coughs> near whether you're looking from uh, sundials right down to your atomic clock, it's basically just an oscillator and a counter. So we have something that oscillates. We count those oscillations, and that sort of marks off time for us. Uh, in terms of our uh, the implementation in the lab, the schematic would be that you take a laser, you want to make that laser really good, so you lock it to a high-performance cavity. Uh, the high-performance cavity is a man-made device. As much as we want it to be really good, it's not quite good enough. So we, uh, when that cavity drifts around, we uh, use the atom to basically discipline that cavity to make sure the frequency stays on resonance with the, an atomic transition. Uh, and then because it's an optical frequency, that optical frequency is uh, pretty hard to count directly. So we use a frequency comb, much the way as uh, Peter described, where you have this teeth on the comb and then you can lock your uh, laser to a tooth on the comb and from that mix it down into the, uh, a regime where you can count it. Um, so if you're going to build a good clock, then you want to know what is a good clock. Um, so the two uh, characteristics that we have for that, the first one is accuracy. So what does accuracy really mean? Um, basically, it's how well defined the frequency is in some sense. So how reproducible is it? If I build a lutetium clock in Singapore, somebody builds a lutetium clock somewhere else, exactly how uh, much are they the same? And so because it's based on an atomic system, it's basically just electromagnetic fields that uh, uh, mess that up, or dark matter, as it might, might well be the case. Um, but in terms of the lab stuff, so uh, basically, uh, electric fields come in, and the dominant effect is through an AC Stark shift or a Stark shift of some description. And so the Stark shift is described by an atomic property, the, the differential polarizability of the clock transition, and that is proportional to the magnitude of the electric field. That electric field can come from a variety of sources, the main ones that we care about. There's the black body spectrum, so just there's a thermal environment in the room, so there's a, a, a temperature dependence to that, so that gives the clock a temperature dependence. In many cases, that's pretty bad, and that means that you have to uh, make sure your clock is held at a really stable temperature, um, some worse than others. Uh, there's an AC stark shift from the trap itself. In our case, we are using ions, so we trap an ion with oscillating electric fields, and I'll say a little <coughs> bit more about that in a slide or two. Uh, and then the very fact that we actually probe the laser, uh, probe the atom, so we have a laser, we shine that on the atom, and the electric field from that laser can also shift the atomic transition as we're trying to drive it. Uh, that's a problem for some. 
and in particular us, I guess. Uh, the another effect from the electric fields is actually from the electric field gradient. Um, so in an iron trap, we also uh, we also confine the atom with static fields, and those static fields contribute a gradient. If your atom supports a quadrupole moment, uh, then you get an interaction. That interaction is basically uh, the non-spherical distribution of a charge that interacts with an electric field gradient. So it affects uh, only states with a higher angular momentum. Uh, magnetic fields, standard Zeeman shift, is, uh, uh, is, as you might know. Um, realistically, DC magnetic fields really aren't so much of a problem. Um, what really matters, and I guess uh, Pete alluded that, to that before, it's the changing magnetic fields that annoy us, right? And so uh, for us, there's one main one that we have to deal with. The rest of it is sort of relativistic in nature, which is the motion of the atom. So as you might imagine, if the atom moves, there's a Doppler shift associated with that. But as long as we've got it in a trap, there's no first order Doppler shift. And so what we care about is the second order Doppler shift, or which is a time dilation shift, which is related to its temperature. And then ultimately, gravity plays a role. These clocks are sensitive to gravity, but uh, as, as, if you're comparing them in, this, in the same gravity field, then it's not so much of a problem. Um, you have to take it into account, obviously, in, in practical applications. Uh, so the other quantity that we care about is stability, uh, and stability, roughly speaking, is how well, uh, how well we can measure the frequency. So uh, we essentially probe the atom, and this was described in a previous talk. So you probe on one side of a resonance, you probe on the other side of the resonance, and you try to make them the same. Now, in a quantum system, especially with, with, if you measure with one atom, you get either one state or the other. So you have to measure it multiple times to, in order to get an average, and there's some sort of noise associated with that. If you've got noise in your signal here, that slope basically turns that into a frequency noise. And fundamentally, if, you know, because of the fact that there's just projection noise when you make a measurement, uh, that gives you rise to a fractional instability that sort of goes as uh, this formula here. This formula reflects the basic things that you might intuitively expect. So if you have a really high frequency, you've got lots of cycles in a particular time step. And so if you count that, you should get something that's pretty precise. Uh, if you have a larger number of atoms, if I measure with a larger number of atoms, somehow I should get better information, so I get a better uh, instability. And then the time uh, that, that we interrogate for, that basically sets the frequency resolution. The longer I interrogate for, the narrower the frequency, uh, better the frequency resolution. So I get a better uh, uh, limit here. So the higher frequency here basically means uh, build a clock with as high a frequency as possible, hence we are using optical clocks. And then you want to have as many atoms as you can. Uh, that's a problem with ions. Uh, and then interrogate for as long as you can, which means make a really good laser. So with uh, ions, why is it that we only have uh, one ion in a clock? And why have we not just always had more? And so the basic idea here is uh, the way in which we trap an ion is with an oscillating electric field. So we have a trap uh, much like this here. And two of those rods we have at an oscillating voltage. And that gives rise to a potential that looks like a saddle. And that basically oscillates with time. And uh, so what happens there is that on average, the iron will sit more towards the center of the saddle. Now, ideally, that iron would sit right at the center there where the uh, potential is flat, which is basically where the electric field is zero. But as shown in this poorly designed GIF, uh, if the uh, electric field, if there's some stray electric field, it will push the iron slightly away from that center point, And what will happen is that it will uh, see an oscillating electric field. It won't see just that zero anymore. Now, if an ion, being a charge, sees an oscillating electric field, then the ion will oscillate very rapidly, which means that it gives rise to a second-order Doppler shift because it's rapidly oscillating backwards and forwards. And then on top of that, uh, there will be a, a, an AC Stark shift from the fact that there's an electric field driving that motion. Uh, and that gives rise to what we call a micromotion shift. There are two components, as I said. There's the second order Doppler shift. And then there's this uh, part here, which is the Stark shift. And the basic idea is that it's actually quite easy for us to control this and make this term, which is the position of the iron, to make that position so that there is no electric field and the uh, micromotion shift is very small. However, if we put another iron in the trap, then that, uh, that's position is basically forced to be somewhere else, 
where the micromotion might not be so easily uh, cancelled. Now, there is an exception, which is uh, where this quantity here happens to be negative. If that quantity was negative, then that means that I can choose this omega, which is how fast this thing oscillates. I can choose that to be a value where this thing that basically be is zero, and then I don't have those micromotion shifts anymore to deal with, and the idea would be that if I choose an atom that has that, then I might be able to go to a multi-ion clock. Might be, right? Um, so... Uh, the other problem that you have is through this quadrupole shift, if you have an atom that has a quadrupole moment, uh, basically when you have multiple ions in the trap, every single ion is stationary, which means it's at a minimum of the potential. The gradient of the potential is the electric field, that's zero. The gradient of that is the curvature, and so therefore there is a gradient of the electric field just because the ion is sitting there in the trap, and therefore there will be a quadrupole shift uh, induced on this ion because of its neighbouring ions. Now the ions are not the same, right, because there's the ones at the end, there's the ones at the middle, so they will see a different quadrupole shift and there will be different shifts for each ion. And so you'd have to deal with that. And so uh, what happens in a, in a multiple ion situation is you tend to get some sort of inhomogeneous broadening from that. Ideally, you would take something that has no quadrupole moment and you would take something that has a negative polarizability and then both of these things would be zero and everybody would be happy, um, except that we just don't seem to find, we don't, haven't found an ion that uh, has those, both of those properties. Um, so we uh, started looking at lutetium for uh, completely random reasons. Um, when I looked at lutetium, uh, I was uh, looking at this 3D1 state. If I looked at that transition there, I asked myself, how does that thing decay? And I really didn't know. So S to D, I associated with a quadrupole uh, tr uh, transition, but it is spin forbidden, and it's also from the zero to the one. That's also forbidden. I didn't know how it decayed, so I figured if I don't know how it decays, it's probably long-lived. If it's long-lived, it should make a good clock. That was the sum total of my knowledge of clocks when I started the project. Um, so I asked a theorist uh, person uh, what would be the mechanism for this decay, and he assures me it was an M1 decay. Um, so anyways, uh, the basic idea here is that with the structure that we have, it's a two-electron system, we have this low-lying D-state uh, system here, and what we get within the one atom is we get three different clock transitions. So we have a, a standard quadrupole transition that's going 1S0 to 1D2, and that has a lifetime of, uh, you know, sub-seconds, so it's, it's not a great clock, but it's okay. Uh, the ones of interest, though, are the 3D2 and the 3D1. The 3D1, as I said, it was a pretty, uh, it's a pretty unusual transition, um, and has a very long lifetime, and we've estimated that to be about 170 hours, or roughly a week, and that's based on the sort of interaction that we get with the atom from the laser, so from that interaction we uh, estimate that lifetime. 3D2 at 18 seconds, that's actually being measured, and probably we should measure it again just to make sure. Uh, so uh, the way that this uh, atom works is it sort of works upside down on some level. So this is our excited state, and we actually detect in the excited state. So the 646 transition there is nominally a closed transition, and so we fluoresce on that one to do Doppler cooling and, uh, and detection. Um, so that cooling transition is sort of like an optimal trade-off between two things. So with a very narrow line width, you actually get a low Doppler cooling limit. Uh, so for an ion, 2.5 megahertz is pretty small, and that gives us a 60 microkelvin Doppler limit, which translates into a 5 times 10 to the minus 20 uh, second order Doppler shift. So the, the Doppler limit for the atom isn't going to be a problem for us in terms of clock accuracy. The trade-off is, is that as this number gets smaller, it's hard to see, you don't get as much many photons, so you don't see it so easily, but two and a half megahertz gives us a good detection in, in a millisecond time frame. Uh, the only drawback to the atom is the sheer number of lasers, which other atoms don't tend to have, there's quite so many. But uh, as I said, this transition is mostly closed. The 350 and the 622 are repump transitions to push us from the ground state back into this state. This one here uh, sometimes gets populated, so we have to empty that. The 895, uh, for the longest time, we didn't even use it because it's actually a fairly rare transition, but when it happens, it's annoying, so we, uh, we have an extra laser to deal with that one. 
Okay, so uh, one of, there were two reasons why we uh, really started pushing on the lutetium clock, uh, and that was for uh, two properties that I'm about to tell you about. So, uh, as I said, this, this atom is a 3D1, it'll have a quadrupole moment. And so if you work out what are the energy level shifts for the standard things, namely magnetic field and a, a tensor interaction, then the tensor interaction basically has a form like this. There is something here which is all to do with angular momentum, so it's just Klebsch Gordon stuff. Then there's some sort of moment here, which in this case is the quadrupole moment. And then there's some function to do with the orientation of the field that's actually being applied. But the important thing is that everything scales by this factor for each of the different states, and that factor for each of the different states, as you see, is minus two-fifths, one, and minus three-fifths, which obviously adds to zero. And that's also true for the quadratic Zeeman shift. So the quadratic Zeeman shift, all the components here, they basically add up to zero. When anything adds up to zero in physics, there's always a good reason for it normally, and so, uh, and that's related to the fact that if you uh, average a perturbation over a uh, over different f for a fixed mf, then what happens is that that is equivalent to an average over the or all orientations of the underlying j angular momentum. And that means that all the electronic stuff actually gets cancelled out, and you end up with something that is an effective j equals zero. So what that means is that if we actually take this transition, and we actually, uh, instead of building a clock based on one of these transitions, if we build a clock which is actually acts on all three transitions and forms an average of those, then what we get is we get all of those shifts that are associated with this type of object. They cancel and we get something that is effectively pretty insensitive to uh, uh, perturbations and so forth. Experimentally, that's actually uh, not so, uh, it's pretty easy to do. So the clock frequency, if it's the average of all of these three transitions, and each of the transitions is then just offset by some sort of microwave field, so we just modulate the laser and we can shift it around from the different levels and sort of probe one transition at a time and form an average. Much the same in most clocks, you will see them averaging over Zeeman pairs. I think uh, Pete mentioned this, and we just average over hyperfine transitions. Um, it's just a different uh, scale. The other thing was uh, when I asked uh, the theorist about the... Uh, the atom, whether they would do some calculations and so forth. They did some calculations and they brought up the fact that this polarizability, they expected it to be minus two, and minus two was perfect, right? Minus two meant that the black body radiation shift, because the black body radiation shift is proportional to that number, is quite small, not super small, but it's manageable. But it was also negative, which meant that uh, we could find this magic frequency that we could operate our trap where we could cancel micromotion. And so that was the sort of idea that we had. Um, so pursuing that idea, we thought about uh, what would really happen in a multi-ion clock if we chucked a bunch of ions in the trap, could we really actually make a clock out of that? And it seemed feasible. Um, and so anyways, we thought that was pretty good and we asked ASTAR for some money, which they agreed. Um, and at the same time, uh, Mariana uh, picked up on what we were doing and she did her calculation and got 0.5, unfortunately. <laughs> so we were sort of stuck with the fact that, okay, we don't even know the sign, so we obviously have to measure that. And then, if you can believe it, we measured it. Um, this is over a whole frequency range here. We measured it. Uh, the most important one is down at this 10.6 micron, which is basically in the middle of the black body spectrum, so it tells you the shifts of the clock due to temperature and it basically goes through zero. So it was very, very close to zero, and uh, that means that the black body radiation shift for the clock is incredibly small, um, incredibly small being it's only low 10 to the minus 18 at room temperature, but more importantly from an experimentalist, if I'm at 35 plus or minus 10 degrees, the uncertainty that I have there is only three times 10 to the minus uh, 19, and that includes their measurement uncertainty on what that value actually is. So practically, we just don't need to really worry about that black body radiation shift. Now, it's hard to be upset by that value, right? Um, but there you were, I was really wanting a negative value, and there we got it, and ended up getting zero. So when that happens, you tell yourself that micromotion probably isn't that bad, and we will be able to sort of deal with it. Um, fortunately, uh, at, I guess, around about the same time, or uh, more recently, uh, 
Tanya Mia Strubler at uh, PTB has been doing work with iron traps and indeed was showing that in fact you could engineer these iron traps so that micromotion wasn't so much of a problem. So the good news is was we have a very low black body radiation shift. So in terms of the various shifts, as I mentioned there before, there's a black body radiation shift. Um, one of the uh, shifts that one thinks about is this DC Zeeman shift. So when we do our hyperfine <coughs> averaging, there's a, the, it cancels the bulk of the sort of magnetic field shift, so you don't have to worry about that too much. But what it doesn't counter for is the stuff that comes from coupling to other levels. So there's always some residual shift there. Now it turns out that that there is never a limit to a clock. So as long as you do your comparison, and you do a comparison where you operate your clock here, and then you, uh, you operate another clock at a higher field, and the idea is you use those two points to estimate just how much of a shift you're getting at your operating condition. Now it turns out that that actually has nothing to do with the details of the atom, and it's only to do with what two field points you actually chose and what is the precision at which you actually measure those uh, two points there. And so in our system, we, uh, we operate at about half a gauss, and we can operate the clock without too many problems at about 10 gauss. So that there is a huge factor. So as long as we can make a clock where we uh, compare the two systems to about 10 to the minus 16, we'll be able to suppress that shift down to the sort of low 10 to the minus 19 as well. I should point out that this lowest field is actually limited by the resolution of the ground state. When we try and drive down to the ground state, we've got to make sure we can differentiate. And because that's just the nuclear spin at the bottom, uh, we have to have a reasonable splitting there to be able to resolve it. The highest field that we can go to is limited by cooling and detection. As soon as the Zeeman splittings in the upper state get too large, then we can't sort of drive the transition very effectively anymore. Um, the other one that we uh, realized later, and we weren't really thinking about it properly, was um, AC Zeeman shifts, and where do they come from? So. Uh, in an iron trap, as I mentioned before, you're driving that with uh, time-dependent uh, potential, some uh, sine wave here. And so that voltage, when you're driving this trap, the trap itself acts like a capacitor. And when you drive a capacitor, then obviously you're going to get a current. And those currents are basically set up in the electrodes. And those, uh, therefore, the oscillating current gives rise to an oscillating field. And the atom will see that. And it will get some sort of uh, perturbation from that effect. Now, it turns out that we thought that that was going to be cancelled by this hyperfine averaging, but it doesn't cancel the component that's oscillating transverse to the, your applied field. So I apply a field in this direction. Any field that's oscillating in this direction doesn't get cancelled, and that's just because those transitions there and also those ones there, they basically have different coupling strengths, and those different coupling strengths don't cancel when you sort of add everything up. And what that means then is that you have to if you want to have an accurate clock, you've got to have a way of actually measuring that. And so you've got to have some sort of probe for doing that. And uh, the, the basic idea, we sort of implemented that uh, idea first in Dimitri's lab, and then we mapped it onto our, our system using barium. So we use a different iron to actually measure this effect. So if I have an oscillating field that's uh, oscillating opposite to or transverse to my applied field, then what will happen is that that there will couple those two levels together. And so if I tune my Zeeman splitting so that these two states are resonant with that oscillating field that I'm applying, and that oscillating field is exactly the, the RF field that we're applying to the trap, then I will get some sort of interaction. That interaction strength is, uh, is determined by the amplitude of that uh, component of the field and also the G factor uh, of the, the ground state here. And in barium, that ground state is very, very well known. And so this gives us an accurate measurement of that B field. And so if we then drive the clock transition with that interaction tuned to resonance, then what happens is that the clock transition splits into two. And that splitting is uh, given by exactly this omega factor, which is exactly this factor here. So by measuring that splitting, we get a measure, direct measure of that oscillating B field. Uh, and so in this case, uh, from our current trap that we have on the table, that RMS amplitude there is about 0.7 microtesla. Uh, 
The other thing that we can do, it's a clock transition and we treat it like such so we can actually servo over that and monitor it over a long time. And so what we see is the sort of Allen deviation, if you like, and that thing averages down. And that shows us that it is stable, so it doesn't change around, change very much, so we don't have to track it or anything. But more importantly, it also means we can measure it very accurately. So there should be no problem getting it to the sort of 1% level or so forth. So in terms of systematics, the, the, the kinds of numbers that we have for lutetium, so uh, at least for this 3D1 clock, our black body radiation shift, as I said, is very, very small, and there's no problem with us getting to the low 10 to the minus 19 for that. The second order Doppler shift is brought about by the cooling, as I pointed out, that's already below 10 to the minus 19 at the sort of limits of the cooling that we, uh, uh, cooling that we get. The DC Zeeman shift is never going to be a limitation for the clock, and then this AC Zeeman shift for lutetium on the 3D1, that shift at one microtesla is uh, <laughs> five times 10 to the minus 19. It's already smaller than that, and we can measure it uh, more accurately. And so realistically then, in terms of those systematics, it's not unreasonable to think that our systematics for lutetium can be at the sort of low 10 to the minus 19 level. But of course, with low 10 to the minus 19, you have to be able to make a comparison that integrates down and actually shows that you've actually achieved that. Um, and of course, with one iron, that will take for a very long time. So uh, the typical uh, stability for a one iron clock is about 10 to the minus 15. And so you're looking at more than a million seconds or whatever just to get down to below 10 to the minus 18. So that then uh, basically demands that we want to have a multi-iron clock just so that we can get a boost in the stability and see if we can actually uh, reach the sort of limits that lutetium ought to be able to provide for us. I should point out that in terms of the properties of an atom, so if, you, if you're asking about the potential of an atom, how well can you do with it, it should be pretty obvious that if your properties of the atom are simply the, the sensitivity factors to the environment, if they are smaller than everything else, then you ought to be able to do better with that atom. So in terms of 3D1, every single property here listed on this table is an improvement over, for example, Euterbium Plus. And I would also claim that Aluminum Plus doesn't have a, a lot of advantages over the sort of properties that we have here. Um, the same is true for 3D2 to a large extent. The only thing with 3D2 is that we do have that slightly larger bl uh, black body radiation shift. But realistically, other people have done better with worse, and so it should be uh, reasonably manageable for that transition as well. Um, so in term, uh, before I talk about the sort of multi-iron clock thing, I just want to at least say what a Ramsey experiment is, just so you can understand why I show you a bunch of sine waves, um, and that you can put some perspective on that. So if I, uh, if I start off with my atom in the ground state, or the excited state, whatever it happens to be, on the block sphere, it sits down there like that. I do a pi over two pulse, which puts it into a superposition state. And now in terms of the, uh, the clock, the basically this uh, vector here is sort of uh, something that is tracked by the laser in a sense. So if I wait, then what will happen is that if my laser is slightly detuned or my atom is off resonance, whatever you want to uh, call it, that vector will slightly, uh, slowly process around here at a rate determined by the detuning. And so then when I do my last pi over two pulse, then what will happen is that that will go to this state, not right up to the top. If I was perfectly on resonance, it would go to the top. If I look at the population, the expected population that I get in the upper state, then it basically comes, uh, rises as a cosine factor there, and that's determined by the, the how long I uh, evolve for, or sit in the dark, and then also the detuning of the laser. And so basically then that sine wave that I get gives me a set of fringes. As long as I identify the center fringe, then I can sort of lock in on the resonance of my frequency. It also gives us the ability to look at frequency differences in a reasonable way. OK, so the multi-iron clock. Um, so as I said, micromotion and the quadrupole moment are the two problems. Micromotion is actually a very small effect, so it's to do with shifts that it'll do. It won't do anything really horrible to the spectroscopy. But the quadrupole shift is quite large, so if I'm trying to interrogate for a long time, it'll mess up the line signal and it'll look like a disaster. So uh, we want to have a way of dealing with that. Um, and so if we look at the quadrupole moment, the quadrupole interaction is a tensor interaction. It's a rank two tensor. 
and that means that it has it's dependent on a field strength of some uh, of of some value, and uh, but more importantly, it depends on the orientation of that thing. It's a gradient of the electric field, so there's an orientation to it, much like a saddle. And so, as a as a as an orientation, it is dependent on two angles, uh, phi, which is shown here, and then there's another angle. But because we are in a linear crystal, that angular dependence drops out from the other angle. So it only depends on the one angle, and it has this form here, 3 cosine squared minus 1, uh, as, as an overall prefactor for the, for the shift for each ion. Each ion has its overall scale factor there, which is to do with where it sits in the crystal. So the one in the middle has a different value, the one at the ends has, has its own value at the ends as well. The basic idea, not sophisticated at all, is just to choose that angle so that that thing is equal to zero and then those shifts would then be zero, right? So uh, not exactly uh, too sophisticated, but we have to have a way of actually measuring that. And the way that we do that in lutetium, this, this 3D1 state is very long lived and also these states are very insensitive to magnetic fields, so we can probe that transition for an incredibly long time. And so if we measure that transition frequency, then that there will have a difference between these uh, uh, values here of 1 minus negative 3 fifths. So basically it uniquely picks out that tensor shift when we measure the, uh, that effect. And so sure enough, if we monitor three ions in a, in a chain, then what we see is we see one sort of cosine wave which is associated with the two ions at either end of the trap and then the one in the middle, it has a frequency shift just because it's sitting in the middle and it sees a different environment from the one uh, at the end. Now this is on the microwave transition. What we want to be able to do is we want to have a clock and we want to uh, see this on the clock transition and make sure that everything makes sense. The only problem that we have is that we don't have one of those silicon cavities that they have at PTB. Our laser is not quite that good. Um, and so in order to do that, what we have to do is we have to have a slightly different technique to sort of see this effect. So if you think about a Ramsey experiment, the way that you can think of a Ramsey experiment is that the laser is somehow keeping track of where the atom is on that block sphere. It slowly ticks around and the laser will track that as long as it's staying coherent with it. But eventually that laser sort of becomes decoheres from that, it loses uh, knowledge of where the atom is on the block sphere. So the way that we can fix that is we can use another atom to do the tracking. So the idea is that we have two atoms, we, we do a pi pulse with them, and when they start moving around the block sphere, even though the laser has sort of lost track of where they are, then each atom has not lost track of, of its other one. And so what we do then is we do a, a Ramsey experiment on those uh, two atoms and then at the end of this, we don't look at the signal from uh, uh, both atoms, we look at a joint signal from the atoms. So we look at a sort of a correlation signal on those two atoms, and that will basically pull out exactly the relative phase between the two atoms. Uh, and after we average away the sort of laser noise, then that we lose a factor of two in the signal, but we can still see what's going on. So if we take that uh, scenario that we had before, we expect the middle ion to be different from the outer two ions. So then when we uh, uh, look at our correlation signal, if we look at ion 1 relative to 2, or we look at ion 3 relative to 2, then we see this phase accumulation on that just because the middle ion is doing something different than the outer ions. If we look at the outer two ions now, there will be no phase accumulation between those two things because they are staying in phase and they are ticking at exactly the, uh, the same frequency. If you look at this, there is a small shift between that that's actually real and that actually comes from a magnetic field gradient. So if there's a small gradient field in the trap, the ion at the end will see a slightly higher field than the one at the other end and so you get a frequency shift between that. And again, with uh, the... the the long-lived uh, states up here on this hyperfine splitting, we can actually pull that out and actually measure very accurately the gradient field that we actually have in the system. If you can measure it accurately, you can cancel it or account for it. So uh, the basic idea then is that you just then rotate that field, go to that magic angle where this thing is zero, and the idea would be that then you can get these fringes to line up. And the good thing about this is because we can go to increasingly longer Ramsey times, we can basically get these things to line up as well as we've got the patients to actually sit there and run the experiment. Uh, 
So um, just to put that into perspective, this is a five second Ramsey time. Each one of this collection of points here is about 500 uh, uh, experiments. So you're looking at a better part of about three quarters of an hour for just one of those points. So you scan, you change the field, you scan, it can take quite a long time. But realistically, now that we have that in place, you would just automate a computer to run through the experiment and, and set that up. Uh, so then you do your correlation spectroscopy uh, on that optical, uh, optical uh, transition again, and now what you see is that all of the ions are sort of uh, in phase. Um, there is a slight decay that you see there that uh, can't be accounted for by anything like a frequency shift between the ions because they're all decaying. And so that is some sort of decoherence mechanism, but that decoherence time is about half a minute. That is the decoherence for two atoms because we're looking at a correlation signal between the two, and that means for one atom, the decoherence time should be about a minute. And that would imply that if you had a really good laser, you could interrogate for at least up to a minute without uh, any problem. In terms of what is actually causing that decoherence, uh, there's two speculations that we have. One of them we know contributes, which is heating. So over a five second period, there's some heating that actually uh, changes the ions uh, coupling with the laser at the end. The other thing that it might be is collisions that actually occur during that time that they're sitting in the dark. And I'm not talking about a collision that hits the ion and, and makes it disappear on some level. We're talking about something that sort of passes by and just sort of interrupts it to interrupt the sort of coherent evolution of the, of the ion. Um, we would want to do better. Um, so if you've got something and you've got some inhomogeneous broadening, to a large extent, your averaging will work if the broadening is very small, but there'll always be some sort of shift associated with that. And so uh, it would be ideal if we can get rid of that. Now, the idea behind hyperfine averaging is very simple, and that is there's a shift of this one that is equal and opposite to the sum of the shift in these other two states. And in a Ramsey experiment, when you do a Ramsey experiment, basically the atom will tick with that different frequency uh, and, and each ion ticks you know, with its own sort of shift. And so the idea would be that during the Ramsey experiment, if we actually just shunt the ion around here and make it sit in the other states for the right duration, then you should basically get that averaging within one sort of interrogation time. So the basic idea then is we take, we, we take our atom in whatever state we're starting in, we do our clock pulse to put it into a superposition, and now just instead of waiting until we do the other clock pulse, what we do is we use microwave transitions to slowly shunt that iron around and then finish off our Ramsey experiment. And then provided we've actually set and, and uh, weighted the right duration in each state, then you should basically cancel any of that broadening that you, should, uh, you would get. So again, to see that, we use correlation spectroscopy again, but to see this effect, we now maximize our tensor shifts. So we align the B field to be along the uh, crystal axis. So when we do our microwave, transition, uh, microwave spectroscopy, we see this large shift between the outer two ions here, the green and the blue, and the red. Um, and now what we do is we look at our correlation spectroscopy as per usual. We see the beating of the outer two ions relative to the middle ion and then the outer two ions compared to each other, there's no uh, drift whatsoever. So now if we implement this dynamic decoupling uh, technique, then basically all of that sort of phase accumulation and shift goes away. So we get rid of that broadening within the one sort of interrogation time, and so we can do a sort of hyperfine averaging as, as a sort of one-shot deal in the experiment. Um, again, we see the same sort of decoherence time, and it's at least consistent with the previous, uh, the previous data. Um, now, if you uh, think about what sort of stability you can get here, so this is a 10-second Ramsey experiment. If I do a 10-second Ramsey experiment with three uh, unentangled ions, that should give me a stability of uh, less than 10 to the minus 16 uh, per uh, root tau. Uh, and that's about an order of magnitude better than, than we sort of have with that sort of single iron kind of thing. And it's also something that if you're trying to get to 10 to the minus 19, then at least it's in a, a reasonable time frame that you could actually do that. Now, um, in terms of actually doing this, the, the clock frequency for us is the hyperfine averaged frequency. It is the average of these three transitions. But clearly, my laser 
is interrogating these atoms on this transition, and so what is my hyperfine average frequency? If I've gotten rid of those shifts, what is my laser frequency and how does that relate to my hyperfine average frequency? And the way that works out is that although my laser is very close to this uh, transition going to the F here, if I simply take the microwave fields that I used to actually transfer this population around here, and what I do is I offset my laser by just the right combination of those two fields, then what I get is that this frequency is indeed my hyperfine average frequency free of all of those shifts and so forth. And if you compare with what that would be if I knew this exact splitting here and this exact splitting, then the, the hyperfine average frequency is this transition frequency plus this combination here. And so what we're doing is we are using a an approximate microwave field that does the job, so it's detuned a little bit from the, the true transition. But what happens is that the servo responds by changing the laser frequency in exactly the right way that this combination exactly matches this combination. And so that's the basic idea behind the dynamic decoupling. Now because of that, it will work on whatever uh, transition that we used. We used that transition here because that's the way we were set up in the lab and that was the sort of uh, the F7 uh, level is where we start all of our experiments, but there's no problem with us doing a transfer down to start on this level. The benefit of doing that is that now I can drive F8 down to straight down to the M equals zero transition and that means that all of the states that are involved in what we're doing are all M equals zero states, and so they're very, very insensitive to magnetic fields. Okay, so uh, in terms of prospects for a multi-ion clock, um, I guess what I would say when you're doing this stuff is you want to ask yourself, what do you think is the best that I could do, right? And so what I would say is if I think about doing this experiment with, say, 10 ions, I would say if I do a 10 ion experiment, can I interrogate for 10, 20 seconds? So lasers these days, maybe we can get out to 20 seconds, and 20 seconds is the limit for the lifetime of our 3D2 state. So this is a sort of a reasonable ballpark to think about that. And um, I would also argue that even though our black body radiation shift is really small, if I'm doing a clock experiment with 10 ions, I think I'm going to need to be in a cryostat just to get rid of the collisions and so forth. And so if I do that, then uh, if I just go through the numbers, the stability that I get on the 3D1 would be mid-10 to the minus 17. It's also mid-10 to the minus 17 on 3D2. 1D2, because it's got that limited lifetime, it probably won't be good enough in terms of the, you know, how we could ultimately do. In terms of accuracy, what would, be we, what would we be limited to? Um, in the case of 3D1, because we've got micromotion, we will probably be limited by micromotion. All of the other shifts uh, for lutetium are small and we're only limited by that shift. Um, we can probe that micromotion very well and for us, uh, we think that 10 to the minus 19 is a reasonable limit for that transition. In terms of 3D2, uh, the AC magnetic field sensitivity is, quite, is somewhat larger than the other transition. But given that we can measure that very accurately, I would say that we would be limited uh, essentially by the sort of the thermal Doppler limit for the atom, which is this sort of mid-10 to the minus 20. Um, the, uh, I should point out, of course, that this assumes that we operate at that magic RF frequency where the micromotion cancels because we happen to have a negative value for that transition. Uh, and then for the other clock, I think we'd ultimately be stability limited in terms of how well we could really do. But what I like about lutetium is the fact that there are two clock transitions there. And so what that gives us is a consistency check by looking at the ratio of those two frequencies. So when you look at these clock papers and you say, and they're saying we, our clock is accurate to 10 to the minus 18 or whatever it happens to be accurate to, the question is, is how do you really know? And if you read that paper, then in many cases, it's very difficult to see, um, you know, how would I be able to do an experiment that could confirm or refute that particular result? You, what you need to be able to do is you need to be able to compare the two clocks to say that they're actually uh, producing the same frequency. And that's very difficult if the clock is sensitive to gravity over the centimetre scale. You've really got to bring them together. And in lutetium, they're together because they're in the same atom. 
And so if you look at that frequency ratio in terms of what it would be limited by, there is a component due to the DC magnetic field, the residual quadratic Zeeman shift. There's a component due to that AC field, and as I said, we've shown how to measure that very accurately. There's a component due to the micromotion, and then there's a component due to the blackbody radiation. Now, the blackbody radiation is gone because you would be operating at a cryostat uh, temperature, so it's heavily suppressed. The DC magnetic field, that's one that, as I said, it's never a limit to the clock because you can make that comparison and you can always integrate down to whatever your clock can actually achieve. And so it's, that's never a limitation. And then in terms of that, we have a very clear signature on how to actually measure that. And so that there is something that we can characterize and push that down to uh, a very low level. And so that means that that ratio now is something that depends really only on the micromotion. And so if you set this clock up and you measure it and you get that ratio, then you should be able to compare that to somebody else who's built their clock somewhere else what is their ratio, if you agree on that ratio, there's a, there's a, you've got a strong incentive to believe that both of those clocks have been set up reasonably. The other thing that you get from that, of course, is that this is now, if you, know, if you now know what this frequency ratio is, you could now say, well, that provides me with a measurement of that micromotion. And in particular, if you really wanted to do it, you could actually just say, I'm going to define that frequency ratio to be whatever I want, right? Obviously, you'd pick something where it's close to where this is zero, but in principle, it wouldn't matter. So if you had a clock and we were convinced that we had done this, our homework properly on these two shifts, then your clock is slightly different from mine, and we would agree that that must be because of micromotion. And so if we agree on that, we can just say, well, okay, we just need to correct one of those clocks to correct the micromotion. And you might say, well, how do you know which one's wrong? And the answer is it doesn't matter. Right? I can either subtract something from mine or you add something to yours, but I would then be assured that the two clocks are actually in agreement. Now, what you would be doing there, if you do that, because you're defining a ratio as well as your normal frequency, you're really just defining both frequencies. And in terms of a standard, what that means is you're defining a frequency to be your time standard, and then the other frequency is being uh, defined to constrain the operating condition of the clock. Right? And I would say that that's exactly what it means to be a standard on some level. Now, in terms of doing that, the key points would be that if you set it up and you say, my clock is this accurate, you would want to be able to say, OK, show me your outlaw town splitting so that we know exactly what your AC uh, magnetic field strength is. Show me that that averages down so that we know that that's not floating around and doing something dorky. And then on top of that, show me the microwave spectroscopy that shows me that the angular alignment that you've set up for doing this outlet town splitting is set. So as long as you've met all those conditions and you've got this ratio in agreement, then I would say there's a very good chance that those two clocks would be in exceptional agreement without having too many problems. And that's without having to do some remote connection between the two clocks to make a direct comparison. And I think that's the true benefit of having two clock transitions within the one atom. You basically get that consistency check on the clock so that you can say your system is truly operating the way that it's supposed to. So we still have heaps to do. Um, and uh, to a large extent, with clocks, it's always just improve, improve, improve. Um, so I've mentioned the fact that we believe that we could get down below 10 to the minus 18. And when you get down to that level, you've got to worry about other things that you haven't thought about. And one of the things that we haven't thought about is uh, the quadrupole moment. Now, I pointed out that that quadrupole moment, uh, the average over the three transitions, cancels and you get zero. But that's only an approximation. And it turns out that there's an interaction with the other levels, just like it is for the magnetic field and so forth. And that gives rise to a residual uh, quadratic, uh, quadrupole moment. And that shift, we believe, would be something that would be at the level of mid-10 to the minus 19, so it would be a significant contribution to the era budget. And so, uh, as it turns out, the same physics that gives rise to that quadrupole moment also gives rise to a g-factor shift. And so, if we accurately measure our g-factors, we ought to be able to accurately assess that quadrupole moment. Um, we've got to improve our polarizability assessment. It doesn't matter for 3D1 because the shift is so small but we do have to improve it for the other clock transition because the blackbody radiation shift isn't uh, so small in that case. 
And then the rest of it is just really improving. So we've got to build better traps. Our current trap has too much micromotion, so we do have to deal with that, and we do have to make better lasers ultimately. We can't rely on correlation spectroscopy forever. But really, the question is, is then what? Now, um, I put this in here because Mariana put up this thing about this, the, the lab, and she made the comment that she said, I'm a theorist, and I'm just amazed all this stuff works at, all at the same time. I'm an experiment, experimentalist, and I'm also amazed that all this stuff works at the same time. That's mostly because we spend most of our time with it not working at the same time, and we're trying to get it to work to run that experiment that we want to run. Um, but the point here is, um, when you look at this, it's pretty hard to see how all of this could ever be a useful device. Right? So it's a pretty complicated setup, and ultimately you would like to somehow take this system out into the field. And so we've really got to start thinking about how do we actually tidy up our stuff here you know, and package it up in a nice way, in a way that we can actually sort of take it out into the field. I should also point out, by the way, that I'm actually doing nothing there. Right? I'm in the photo. If I was doing something, I'm wearing the wrong glasses, right? But um, that's beside the point. Um, so anyways, on, in, in terms of sort of tidying this stuff up, one can take the, the leap of faith and ask yourself, can you actually start thinking about do, making an integrated device? So uh, our iron trap system is the, basically the bulk of this whole picture here. Um, and the question is, is whether or not we can shrink that down and sort of shrink down all the laser coupling, which I think you know, there's part of it there and part of it there. And so we would, uh, we've now sort of got some funding to work towards an integrated device. And so the basic idea of this is uh, if you have a CMOS trap with the uh, surface trap where this is all your electrodes and everything are here, and the idea the iron sits ab immediately above that surface. Underneath the CMOS trap you can put in some photonics and you can have sort of uh, gratings and so forth to kick the beams up to actually focus onto the iron. And the idea would be that you could uh, do all this on a sort of a chip scale with the idea that you put all of your uh, electronics and everything all together on the chip. That seems like an incredibly ambitious plan, but as it turns out, um, this technology is already being pushed for quantum information with uh, trapped ions, and groups have already made astounding progress in terms of doing this. So in fact, everything that's actually pictured here has already been implemented in experiments. So they've put together iron traps with CMOS foundry techniques that trap ions, and they've put in things with waveguides uh, for doing this laser beam addressing, and they've also got uh, silicon APDs operating so that you can actually see the light scattering and, and picking that up. So it seems not unreasonable that we could use that technology for clocks. The benefit of that, I think, is that now you would have a scalable platform for clocks. So if I can make a chip where I can trap an iron and do this, it would seem perfectly reasonable that I could make multiple copies of this and have many irons uh, on a chip. If you're going to dream, dream big. That's my attitude. Um, so uh, with that, I will uh, finish and uh, thank the members of my group. Um, so uh, the initial experiments that we really started off here were really kicked off by Radu Kazan and Arafin, which started with no knowledge of lutetium at all and having to sort of find all the wavelengths and stuff that we do here. But in the later years, uh, once we sort of got operational, uh, Dean and Kyle in the background there mostly, um, have really pushed this project forward and, and really made it into something that's uh, a pretty impressive um, piece of machinery. Uh, and with that, I will leave you with that uh, thing that I found from the wiki.